Let's try that. Amen. So, okay. Okay, we're still got people coming in, but we're going to get started if possible here. Uh-oh. Hold on for a second. I'm having an issue. Let me see how can I do this. Okay. Try this again. Okay, here we go. Okay, so um this thing is, is recording every word that comes out my mouth and, and what you'll be saying. I'm just trying something different out. This could be for people that can't hear well. They can see what's being said. So this is just so don't focus too much at, at the typing at the bottom. It's just something that we're trying out, okay? Um, so last week, what we want to do right now is just a review. Someone who would like to give us a review of, of last week's orientation class. Anyone? Um, I don't mind doing it. Yes, I can, Sister Lisa. Um, well, you said it's important to um, not just read the book, but the introduction and and um, the four because it kind of sets the tone and tells you about the book. Uh, we talked about um, understanding um, the Hebraic connection between um, worship um, and our current Christianity, the current way that we worship. And then you challenged us um, to, in the homework to determine whether um, Worship is guided by the church, or church, or is the church guided by worship? Amen. Um, Thank you. Very, th that's very good. Very good. Anyone else would like to add to, again, uh, what the woman of God just brought forth? Anyone else? Uh, uh, again, right before <laughs> us, um, the main thing is what was learned in the introduction. What could we ask everyone to go back at the introduction and the four words? What did you get from out of that? Yes, yeah. Doctor Short. That was the four. Four words were tabernacle, temple, synagogue, and um, well, that's more so chapter one, isn't it? One, yeah, yeah. But I want to, I want to go back to the four words in the introduction of it before we get into get into that aspect. Not sure, those four words are in the introduction. Introduction. Yeah, it, it, it is, but he don't he don't start teaching it till chapter one. And I don't want to get into that right now. Right, because you, I'm sorry, you wanted, you wanted to know what is the importance of forwards. Okay, yes, what was it? Um, well, when I... What took place in the forward? It tells you about the author. Yeah, about the author, um, because he asks God about, you know, what he should do, and he's led um you know that he wrote down the four the four words was a way to start you know um uh at being um you know looking at what god uh, wanted him to do about modernizing worship Okay. Well, you know, and let me clear Dr. something up a little bit. Okay. Now, because in chapter one, it said four words, F-O-U-R-D-A. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to get into that. I want to get into where it says the forward. Okay. F-O-R-E, W-O-R-D. Oh, four and that's words. not talking about four words, right? No, four no, words. that's that that is where the bishop that's something different, yeah. Yes, okay. So I just wanted to be clear on that we have four words and we have four words. Right. So I'm not sure if you can pronounce it a whole lot differently, but the spelling, uh, but it's the spelling that I'm looking for. And the reason why I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but this is not the author talking. This is someone else talking. And this right. is uh, someone that is in high admiration of the author and a high appreciation of this book, which, right. uh, which yeah. means a lot because anybody can praise themselves. But this Ooh. gentleman has someone that of high intellect uh, and very uh, uh, artistic in his in his uh, writing and very, uh, I tell you, the way he wrote was, he could have wrote a book himself. I just love the four words. So, but that's pretty much, th that was there. We wanted to go over there. I don't want to spend a lot of time there. We have so much to get into. 
So let's talk about week uh, one assignment for, for the masters and the doctoral. Okay, so what was week one assignment? What were you supposed to hand in? Well, I know at one time I said, oh, we're not going to have no homework, but we did pass out a couple of things that we wanted everyone to look up. One was if you're not busy to do, and what was that? Um, One was if you didn't have homework from the, the two other teachers, then then do what? Does the church set the tone Thank for you. worship or worship for the church? Set the tone for the church. Okay, so a, a few of you did hand in your papers on that. Okay, so let's let's talk about that for a minute. Who would like to be the first one? Don't I don't need you to read your paper. I want you to be your paper. Tell me what you feel. Does the ch church set the tone, or does the musician, uh, the the worship set the tone? I shouldn't say musician. So what say ye? I believe that the worship sets the tone. Excuse me, it's Paul is talking. Oh, oh okay. I believe that the worship sets the tone for the church because it puts you in a mood to prepare to worship the Lord. The whole idea is to worship him. So it's okay. Not about okay, thank you, Sister Paula. Uh, okay. Someone else, what do you uh, say? Ye? Who was that, Sister Thelma? It wasn't me, Pat. I mean, our that was was sister. <laughs> but, but a lot of times the churches, some of them do lay, rely on the music to get them going when they should already be prepared before they even get to church to come with that mindset. But a lot of churches that I do, they do rely on the church to get people motivated and inspired to get moving and going into the worship. Okay, thank you. Okay, someone else who did speak up a while ago. That was me. I was okay, saying go the same ahead. Thing. The, the, the worship does set the tone for the church and when you come into church you know you have to be in the presence of god you know wanting to serve him you know um it all it, it can be like you supposed to uh pray be in prayer that's part of worship as well besides singing you know um you just come in being in the presence of god and ready to worship okay so part of what i'm hearing it's, it's, a, it's a personal responsibility to come in prepared, but then too, I'm hearing um, that the worship pretty much starts everyone off, uh, prepares the atmosphere. Um, no. And I think most of you may say that, correct me if I'm wrong, because worship is where most services start. Mm -hmm. um, I Anyone want, else? I wanted to praise uh, the Lord. Uh, Reverend Jackson. Yes, I wanted to say that I believe that worship sets the tone because um, a lot of times, even after the worship, it's, you know, um, part of the service is over. The pastor, before he will come or the speaker comes, they may have a certain song that they may ask to be sung before they bring the word. And so I think, yeah, the worship part of it is a big part um, and it does set uh, the service. Okay. Now uh, another, another person, but listen to my question carefully. I'm asking, does the ch church set the tone or does the worship set the tone? Now, most, some of you answered, what should be taking place, mm -hmm. but we're not asking that because what should be taking place, we should come our, already in the church with a spirit of worship, but that's not the case. Right. A lot of people have been no, they've been had hard time on the job, the neighbors getting on the nerve, or the spouses, or what so have you. So they need the church to, to 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 do what it's supposed to do, and so uh, so it's, it it sounds like yeah we could come in there like that, but if we had it like that, then we wouldn't probably wouldn't need to go to church. <laughs> but uh, but we need the church to change the atmosphere in our life and in our heart. Okay, someone else will get ready speaking for Reverend Jackson. Praise the Lord. Hello. All right. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Was that you, Atlanta? Yeah, I, I just was going to say that I believe that worship sets the tone, but I also believe that you all you always have to be prepared. But the, usually the pastor and the worship team works together in order to be able to bring the message. So usually the pastor will have the worship team um, sing different songs that prepare that will prepare the church. Um, to receive the word. 
Awesome. Awesome. I like that. Now, what she just did, she said, yes, we may hear from them, but we don't hear from them before the pastor get with them. And the pastor relays the message to the worship leader. This is what we're doing today. I need songs that's going to that's gonna point to this direction. So now we're going back to the head, the pastor, the leader of the church that's over, I, over the worship leader. The worship leader is, and correct me if I'm wrong, the worship leader is not over the pastor, but the pastor over the worship leader. So whether the pastor... Uh, uh, gets involved with the singing or not, it is his or her responsibility to relay the what atmosphere. Uh, and, and so this is why many pastors, especially organized churches, the pastors get with the worship leader and says what song they want or uh, or they discuss it. And but that's an organized church. You oh, say ye. Uh, Anyone, Doctor Landa. Yes, Doctor Shore. I'm sorry. That's you okay. had Apostle and Lisa. They was trying to get in earlier, and I just want to hear what their thoughts uh, yes, were. Yes, I can't. I can't. Now I want to say that I can't see all the hands. The screen won't let me see everything, but persevere. Okay. Yes. Uh, who, you two ladies, who wants to be first? Praise the Lord. Yeah. Hey, hey, hello, everyone. I believe the church should set the tone for worship, and the reasons why I say that is because. If the word of God is being preached in this totality, if the man or woman of God is living a life that exemplifies Jesus, if if the praise and worship leaders are preparing themselves, I think it should be, I think the church to set that tone. And, and the way that tone can be set is that, first of all, people must have reverence for the house of God. Nowadays, when people come in, they're not thinking about worship because it's everything else is going on but preparing their hearts and their minds to receive what is to be said what is to be taught or preached to them that day um there's a lot of confusion going on in the church um before church even starts when people should be praying they should be meditating and i believe that it's up to the pastor to set the overall tone of worship just like everyone has stated by getting with the praise and worship leaders who should be preparing themselves and living a life as well in order mm -hmm. to bring people before the presence of the Lord. Okay, awesome, That's awesome. Okay, thank you. Uh, who, who was the next person with that? Uh, Lisa, Evangelist. Yeah, I, um, well, I agree with everything you guys say should be taking place. Um, I interpreted the assignment differently and I interpreted the assignment to say, um, what happens? Does the church guide worship or does worship guide the church? Well, worship should guide the church. But in our current culture, I believe that the church guides the worship. We got the praise team. You got the sound system. You got the stage, the lights. You got all of this stuff. That, and is, is that really true worship? But to me, a lot of times we're just being spiritually entertained. And like Dr. Short said last week, music can make anybody feel good for a minute. Yeah. But when mm -hmm. you experience true worship, that's going to that's just going to stay with you. And I don't as much as I love church music and concerts and all that. I don't get that. Wow. Wow. OK, mm -hmm. well, OK. Anyone else? We just want to make sure that those that want to say something has an opportunity right now. Dr. Short? Yes, it's Joe. Uh, yeah, um, I looked at it a little bit different. And um, uh, I I felt that the, that the church and worship are, are interdependent. They rely on each other. The church provides the platform for worship. Uh, and while worship influences and shapes the identity and the direction of the church okay. so so they it's it seems to me that they they are uh, interdependent okay um anyone else um now you've mentioned the word interdependent yes okay but okay i'm um, thinking about the word interdependent Okay, um, so let me make sure I'm getting you right. They they are separate, but they're not separate. Or well, they work. They they if it's working well, they work together. If you didn't have a church, uh, you'd be out in someone's park or something, or in a storefront. 
a church maybe or whatever. Uh, in other words, the church provides, the church itself provides a structure, a place to go, a place to sit, you know, a place uh, uh, for okay, you're, gatherings you're talking about the physical prayer. building of a church. Yeah, okay. but, not I, I, but not only the physical, but it's, uh, maybe it's the denomination of the church. It is the, it is the, the culture of the church. They can be, they can be different. Okay. And, and we're definitely going to get into that. We're definitely going to get into denominationalism uh, as far as the church is concerned and, um, and just see. Okay. So let, let's go to week one. Okay. The, the, uh, the first is the Hebraic connection to the contemporary uh, or what is the Hebraic connection to the contemporary Christian, uh, uh, temporary Christianity for the contemporary Christian? Now, I want to say, in other words, I'm put this in, but is there any connection to Hebraic uh, worship and today's worship? Do you see any connection that we are worshiping very similar uh, to uh, the old Jewish culture? Do you see any connection at all? <laughs> Hmm. Not no, really. I, no, no one sees any. No. Okay. Okay. Let's keep it oh. moving. No problem. Okay. The second thing is the three dimensions of worship: the outer court, the inner court, and the most holy place. Okay. So we want to really get into that um, mm -hmm. about those uh, three places. The third benefit is discussion of the Shekinah glory. We're going to get into mm -hmm. that uh, tonight, uh, and why did God not tell them to build a church? Uh, and, and we're, we're, that's one of our main questions. Why did not uh, God say build a church? And instead, why did he use the word tabernacle or, or sanctuary? So let's look at the tabernacle. We know that a tabernacle has uh, pretty much, uh, let me try something here for Okay, so when I'm I'm gonna go back, I was looking for something here. I'm I'm gonna change the screen. I want to go into the book, as I hope you have your books with you. I want to go into the book, so I'm gonna pull the book up if I can. Okay, it says multi-dimensional worship, and we're actually more so in chapter. I'm try to pull this down. I think I'm going to pull it up. I think I'll be better like it up because um, I can't see my, hold on. Okay. So on page 45 of your book. Okay. So it's talking, um, we're still on page 46 now, the outer court. So the, it says the outer court deals with the sinful flesh of humanity. So we're looking at the multi-dimensional worship. This is something that I've never got into before or thought about the multi-dimensional worship. Maybe you have, maybe you have, haven't, but this is where we're starting at. Okay, looking at worship in three dimensions. Before we pretty much looked at it, most of the time we think about worship, we're thinking about um the singing and and a little bit, and we also know worship is is a lifestyle as well. But ninety percent of the time, when we're talking, if you're looking at our discussion tonight, we're pretty much looking at worship is is dealing with uh singing and and praising God. When it's, when we do know uh, that it's a whole lot more than that, but here it's broken down, and I think the way that the uh, man of God has this broken down, I think it's going to help us. He starts off saying that worship starts off with a I'm paraphrasing a self-examination. Paul mentioned, but let a man uh, examine himself whether or not he build a faith. So Paul is right with the author and right with the Old Testament. He break worship because he break worship before you can get to the holies of holies and the most holy place. You start from the outside. You don't start from the inside and then go out. You mm -hmm. start from the outside before you get in. So here, what, what I'm getting out of this is that um, we must acknowledge our faults before God. We must uh, examine ourselves as Paul says. But let me stop. I want to hear from you. I need to hear what did you think about what the author was saying about this type of worship do you agree with him yes yes mm -hmm. yes anybody disagree 
Okay, so the, it says here the outer court deals with the simple flesh of humanity. This is the reason why I call this dimension the worship of the sinner. So, um, anybody having a problem with that? Him calling it the worship of the sinner? No. No. Okay. No. Okay. So again, so this is again uh, where man recognized. That yes, we are saved by grace, not a works. And so this is why repentance is necessary and required. The first step in the course of worship is a design for personal acknowledgement of sin. And this is what was crucial. And I mentioned, uh, referred to this, is that this is something that Paul talked about, but let a man examine himself. Again, and sometimes the church needs to allow people to examine themselves and, 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 and not tell them what they are or who they are, but allow them to learn. This is your personal re responsibility. It's not your pastor's job to tell you, man of God, you're doing a great job. You ought to know where you're at with God, how your walk is with God. The, so it says here, uh, again, to the, uh, for you to acknowledge, again, our uh, Again, the first step is the corporate worship is designed for personal acknowledgement of sin, guilt. And in this case, the animal sacrifice uh, represented the repentance and uh, asking of forgiveness. So here, um, this is something that many did. Uh, and boy, thank God that God, uh, through Jesus Christ, we no longer have to sacrifice the animals because uh, I might not have Bentley in. <laughs> <laughs> get, get, get mad and Bentley got to go. But okay, but here we go. But that's the crazy thing that the animals paid for man's sin. When you really think about it, they were the one that were being killed. Uh, and so, uh, but this dimension of uh, dimension of worship is, is significant and necessary for us to begin our approach uh, of the Almighty. So again, worship starts with repenting. I don't know if we ever said that before. I don't know. I don't believe we said it in the first theology of worship, mm -hmm. but worship starts off with repenting, not with hallelujah. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. That's mighty. That is mighty. Yeah. Worship starts off. So, okay, saints of God, and some some of you are pastors in here. So, if worship starts off with repenting, what should be one of the first thing that we should be doing when we're starting our service out? Repent. Repent. Say it again. Repenting. Oh, you said repenting. Okay. Well, I mean, we're not going to walk in church and just, Father, forgive me for my sins. How do a pastor prepare for this out of core experience? You are a pastor. Now, how do you do I that? To get the people to pray, to pray. come to the altar mm -hmm. and pray. Mm -hmm. There we go. We start. And, and and this is old Pentecostal. I don't know if they do anymore, but when you walked into the church of some Pentecostal churches, and, and I can only speak to my experience, I was Pentecostal, we had to walk from the door and go straight to the altar, get on our knees, say yeah. a prayer before we sat in our seat. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. the way it used to be. You yeah. did not sit down and start greeting people and start uh, talking. You were quiet. You walk up to the altar get on your knees, and whatever people said, I don't know what they said, but to me, that sounds like what the author and what God is calling on requiring, that we come yeah. into the place, and before we start singing, start uh, sacrificing to him and, and repenting first, before we do anything. Yes. Dr. Short, yes. Uh, in, in the chapter we read, um, they talk about uh, the priests, you know, in Hebra in the Hebrew times, uh, mm -hmm. going into the te going into the uh, temple or into into uh, the where the Ark of the Covenant was. Yes, uh, in the holy uh -huh. in the holy place that they had to be free of sin because uh, because they would wind up dying. Wow. And and they Amen. would they they put a, a rope around the priest's ankle. Yes. So mm -hmm. that if he died during the experience of being with God, you know, a, a person to person in on the top of the um, ark, you know, what is the seat between mm -hmm. the, the two angels where God is supposed to be uh, sitting and waiting and waiting for us that they could drag him out of the uh, uh, Holy of Holies without having to go in themselves. Amen. That's, Thank you. Yeah. That's and how, that's how fearful they were. Yes. But uh, 
Sister Thelma, how was I, it? I, since you're talking, I'm, I'm going to let you go ahead and answer this for me because I think you might be going there. Okay, but how did they know that the priest died? What, what else besides the rope was given to him? The oh. bells stopped ringing. They had bells. That's right. Was that Sister Thelma talking? Ringing. Yes. Uh, I was going to ask you something else <laughs> pertaining to what uh, I can't Judy but remember saying I'm trying mean. to call your names. Don't ask. <laughs> okay, so let let's let's uh, ask that for Sister Thelma. Sister Thelma, go ahead. You had something else. Uh, um, you know when she was talking, I was thinking about when they tell us we have read before you approach God, always have your just don't come to any kind of way. Always be prepared because of His holiness. You come righteous before Him. And that yes. would just make me think of before you approach God, make sure you have your heart right. And if you have something that you're dealing with, repent of it before you even approach him. And I remember uh, the spirit always told me before you pray, you know, praise God first and worship him first before you even begin praying. But one of the things to make sure your heart is right and you're, you know, you're right with God before you approach him because of his holiness. Okay, do you remember the scripture? And someone helped me to find this. Is that the Bible said before you offer your gifts up, that you need to go and make things right first? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you cannot worship God if you have not, if you don't upset me, done made my day bad, and I can't even focus now. The Bible says He don't want to hear that worship. He wants you to go and get right with Dr. Short or whoever, and then bring your gifts to the altar. So sometimes mm -hmm. you can't go straight into worship if you're if you're bound in sin and especially if you're the guilty party. So th so that's scripture there. I don't know exactly where it's at, but that's I know it's New cool. Testament. It's found it. Uh, okay, someone uh someone else had a uh a question, comment, or statement concerning this. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on. I'm on seven thirty already. Oh my gosh. Okay, <laughs> let me see. Can I? switch the page okay i have a highlight down the bottom it's probably on page 47 if we can acknowledge that the worship most christian experience today is uh equivalent to the outer court of, of worship um where that's where we should be at there that's where it starts it says then we must pursue with humility and anticipation the next comparative dimension of worship based on our understanding of the of the mosaic uh tabernacle or original intent of uh, earthly worship. We must investigate at least two more dimensions of corporate worship. The second dimension of worship is the inner court or the holy place. This is the place that I refer to as the worship of the saints. It is ideal uh, with the souls uh, it, and it deals with the souls of people. And in Moses' day, it was a place of priestly preparation. Priestly preparation. So what does it mean by priestly preparation? Does someone have their hands up? See, it says, let me see who's there. Scripture, Matthew 5, 23. Mm -hmm, that's yeah. okay, would you like 24. to read that for us, Apostle? That's... Matthew 5, 23 to 24. Mm -hmm. I think she's found the scripture where it talks about leave your gifts yeah. at the altar, I believe. Yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's Matthew 5, uh, 23 to 24. Yes. Okay. So uh, we at least we know where it says. So you don't have to read it. So, uh, so now, uh, but I love this part here. You need to have this highlighted because this is going to come up. This section here is crucial. It says all the, um, it says all the furniture and the fixtures uh, typify the church. So when we said typify. What do we mean by the by typify? Typify. Because most of you Typif had Bible. Typify. Had, 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 say it again. They're usual. Excuse the me, Dr. Short, where are you? I'm on page 47 in 47. your book. Is this referring to typology? Yes, it's referring to typology. This is referring to typology. All these artifacts, it says the table, the candlestick, the showbread is all a type. They reference to something they're, they're mentioned in the Old Testament, but they're, they're again, uh, pointing to a uh, person, place, a thing in the New Testament. It says, uh, so it says the candle, look what it says. It says the table represent a place of learning mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. or instruction. Uh -huh. We right. need to know this. The candlestick. Represents illumination or revelation. 
You hear me talk about that all the time. The showbread represents divine nourishment or substance. Yes, God. This is deep. This is awesome stuff here. So, no, so now we know that they just weren't walking around with um, these things, but these things represented something for us today. So again, backing up, the table represents a place of learning and instruction. So sometimes we need to tell people we need to come to the table, not to eat, but to learn. Mm -hmm. Eat up. Okay, the candlestick talks about illumination and revelation. And there is a difference. Re revelation, let me uh, go again. Well, no, we done taught this. Someone else tell me, what is the difference between revelation and illumination? I done spoke on this so many times. Uh -huh. What's the difference between a revelation and illumination? Well, a revelation is someone that God has, you know, given you knowledge or something, you know. And, and uh, uh, illumination means that your mind has thought of something. So, yeah. Okay, a, not, not quite, Sister Julie. Not, not quite. Someone else. Revelation and illumination. Uh, not, we don't have this. If you've been with me in Bible 1 and her, especially hermeneutics. Okay, so we can move on. Revelation is, as Sister Julie was saying, revelation is God speaking to us. Our illumination is understanding what he meant when, when what he said. So many people can read the Bible, but don't mean you understand it. Our illumination is understanding what you read or what you heard. So revelation is God revealing. He did, but we still need illumination of the revelation to understand what God is talking about. So that's how that works. So yes, you got, so sometimes we pray, Lord, I need a revelation. No, it's not a revelation that you want. You want illumination of the revelation. Yes, amen. Okay, so the show breed represents divine nourishment or substance. It just represents that, that God wants us to have, that we must have the word. This is why I'm not an advocate uh, when people say, oh, the spirit of the Lord was so high, the word didn't even come. Well, but you said the word didn't come. Jesus didn't come. Right. <laughs> no, Jesus didn't show up because the musician was so good. I mean, the singer, but they were they were getting down. And Jesus, the word you said the word didn't come. Well, in the beginning was the word, word with God, and the word was God. Now, I'm, this is my personal belief. I was a pastor, and I, I may be a pastor again soon. But I still I don't care how hard y'all shout. I'm gonna drop a word in the house. house. If y'all can shout an R, I can preach an R. That's how, that. That was my mindset. If y'all can shout that long, then y'all can sit that long and listen to me. Because I, <laughs> I would tell me, I, I listen to you, and you're gonna listen to me. And so, but but that's that, that's how I wrote. Because I felt like that the word of God. I don't care how well you're saying, the nourishment comes from the word of God. Unless you're singing it, and yes, you can sing it, and and different things of nature. So okay, it is a place for instruction, obedience, and development of the body of Christ. It it is impossible to enter the ho most holy place without going through a season in the inner court. So the inner court is preparing your mind, your body, and your soul to go in. You're not in the most holy place yet, but it's, it's more preparation. So the first preparation is, Lord, forgive me. The second preparation, okay, as, as Sister Thelma alluded to a while ago, getting that mind right, get, get just getting everything out your mind, TV shows, all kinds of junk. It may not be no sin, but just getting your mind focused on the task at hand, and that is giving God his praise, giving God the glory, just totally thinking on him. Um, so contemplating. Contemplating is thinking, meditating. So we contemplate God. We think about him. We meditate on him. And so let me stop right there since I'm using that word. So how was it, and especially those of you on the master and doctoral level, I'm going to stop right there before we go into the most holy place because you also had some uh, little homework to do that talked about how did other religions go into their worship, into their meditation, and their contemplation? Someone like to bring up what you found out uh, concerning some of those other beliefs. I can do that. Sure. Um, I took uh, Buddhism. And um, uh, I called it uh, Buddhism, uh, religion, philosophy, and moral discipline. And 
uh, in in the Buddhist religion, um, uh, they gather, they have temples and they're very colorful and uh, they, uh, they have a lot of uh, discipline, but they are a non, uh, non uh, theistic belief. They do not believe in God. They believe in enlightenment. They believe in study. They believe in giving alms to the poor, uh, donations to the temple. And um, it is Buddhism is one of the world's largest religions. Yes, but what I want, Sister Julie, I, I yes. really want to talk about uh, Buddhism and meditation because um, yes. one of the things that we, I sent to you, it says meditation is central to Buddhist practice. So yes. I'm not sure if you found anybody find anything that really breaks down meditation because we're comparing Bo Buddhism meditation with Hindu meditation and then Christianity and our belief in meditation. Yeah, I have um, Buddhists uh, um, in their temples. They attend worship, meditation, and learning, and uh, they um, they uh, they draw uh, mandalas, which are beautiful um, Indian pictures, uh, spiritual pictures in the sand, all different colors sand, and they meditate on those. They use beads to meditate. And they sit with their legs crossed and they could be outside under a tree like the Buddha did or in the temple. Okay. And, I can hold on. Let, let's, uh, thank you, Sister Julie. So anyone else have anything else on, on anyone else do Buddhism? I think there's at least one other person. No one else did. Okay. So, so we can move on. Buddhist meditation often involves focusing on, uh, on breath. On breathing, yes. and observing bo bo bodily uh, sensations, or contemplating specific objects or concepts, with the aim of developing inner uh, wisdom and uh, compassion. Okay, anyone? Did anyone do Hinduism or Christianity or Islam or Judaism? I have um, Hinduism. Okay, what you have? They they have elaborate rituals and ceremonies. They offer flowers and incense and foods to their gods in the temples or at home. Um, they are they also use chanting and prayers during worship. For example, during Diwali, they light oil lamps and wave them in front of their gods. Well, okay, so there's a major difference between Buddhism and Hinduism. Okay, now so let's think about Christianity. Uh, how do we use meditation? If we use meditation. And how important yeah. is it for us? Now, because again, let's think about Buddhism. Buddhism says, Buddhism is the central focus of everything they do. I mean, uh, meditation is crucial. Hinduism is still at a high level. But Christianity on a place from one to 10, if, if Hindu, if, uh, Buddhism is a 10 out of 10, that it's pretty much almost everything to them. Where is it at, uh, 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 what, what number will we say for Christians, where is meditation at? I think that, um, it's my understanding about if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. um, prayer is talking to God, meditation is listening to listening God. Listening to right. God. And we really don't do a lot of that. We always <laughs> whine, whine, whine. You know, we don't. I, and let, let me just speak for me. Let me not speak for the rest of the 8.5 billion people on the planet. Um, I probably do way more talking than listening. I have to make a conscientious effort. To like, okay, I need to shut up and see what he says. Amen. Okay, anyone else? Where, do, where is Christianity? Is it at two, three when it comes down to meditating? Or are we up there with an eight? Now, right, right behind the Hindus and the Buddhists, no, they no. talk about it. No, no. not no. even close. Yeah. Okay, so but they, it's not like we're not we're, we're not given um a personal experience because David said he meditated on the Lord day and night, and as uh, Sister Lisa said, it's not uh it's different between meditation and praying. Praying is us going at it. Father, in Jesus' name, I want this. God, I need that. Lord, don't forget about me. <laughs> that's us praying. But meditation 
is just allowing, closing our eyes and just thinking about his goodness. And I think that's a good thing. I, I think that Christians, sometimes we think, uh, we worry about, oh, isn't that a cult practices? It's a godly thing. It's in scripture to, yeah. to meditate. Uh, the yeah. head of, uh, if we were going to, uh, if Paul is the head of all preachers, David will be the head of all worship. And uh, and David talks about it as a, as a uh, major worship leader about meditating uh, day and night. Did anyone else have anything uh, else to add upon meditation? And Dr. Short, I was just going to say it has to be an intentional thing because we get our mind is so easily distracted. Like if I'm going to meditate, I have to have that phone cut off and everything mm -hmm. else. You, it's just one of those like you go in your closet and you have to be quiet and silenced there mm -hmm. and just focus. Uh, and sometimes you just take that one scripture and just talk to God, and he'll just start opening that scripture up and giving you other scripture and revealing things to you, but it has to be intentional, and you have to be quiet. And it's a lot of times, like the sister was saying earlier, sometimes the mind be racing and running with so many other different things. You really have to cast all that stuff out to just stay focused on him and what he's trying to teach you in that setting where you are. And a lot of times, it takes just a little thing to break off that connection. Then you try to get it back, and it's like, you blew that uh that that time right there when you got off track with God and let something else take the place of that. Absolutely. Okay, awesome. Very, very true. Okay, look at this. I highlighted this on, on this on uh, page 47. And I love what's said here. And I want us to talk about this. He says, I say that to capture what happens in some churches when they have a phenomenal worship experience. Some people leave the sanctuary saying, the Lord sure stopped by today, or what a move of God today. Almost as if it don't happen. I'm paraphrasing. I'm looking at, almost as if it didn't know how it happened. Or, wow, that was strange. God really showed up today. Oh, and some people do <laughs> that. God showed up today. And so when we think about what we say, it seemed like when God shows up, it's a strange thing. You mean God? coming to his house is wow he was here today and 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 the author picks about this because that shouldn't be the case god showing up in church shouldn't be a strange thing mm -hmm. what say ye yes yes, yeah, because, yes. Uh, uh, dr short when we read back early in the earlier chapter it tells us his present is always present uh and it's us that saying he showed up when he's always been present it's us engaging with him he never leaves yeah. His sanctuary. But is mm -hmm. it his sanctuary or did we build it for ourselves? I, I think <laughs> that was part of the homework in my mind anyway. Like so many of these edifices don't have nothing to do with God. Wow. I, and that's right. a very good point. So, uh, yeah. so the mm -hmm. Thelma, what, what she, and she addressed it, what you were saying is true. Uh, you would think that if it's God's house, he will be there all the time. But let, I'm jumping way ahead. We must truly remember the building is not really God's house. We are God's house. We are the yeah. temple. It's mm -hmm. just a place where we congregate uh, and bring all our little temples together into the sanctuary. So we yeah. bring, so the temple is actually going into the sanctuary. We are the temple. The church mm -hmm. is more like a sanctuary of, of congregating. And I think he breaks that down further on, you know, uh, the difference between a temple and a sanctuary. Sanctuary is where people gather, but a temple is, uh, again, where he wants to dwell. So we are, again, that dwelling place. But again, as uh, Sister Lisa bring out and brought out, um, we wonder when we're building these churches, and I mentioned it last week, when we're building these churches, whose house is it? And um, so I, I I believe that meditation would help us to meditate on whose house it is. And meditation starts with the shepherd. It starts with the pastor because that the pastor is going to constantly remind the church, this is God's house as you enter into God's house. You know, and, and but sometimes we say, well, we, when you come to our church, you need to come to our church. And so we might need to change our terminology says, I want you to, uh, we want to invite you to the house of God. You know, and where is it at? Uh, well, it's on 22 Matthew Street or whatever. But I think we have to try to to focus more that when we talk about God's house, we mention it as God's house and not our place. And yeah. I think it's it, it would be almost insulting as someone spoke of your house like it was their house. 
they don't pay no rent, don't pay no bills, <laughs> but they spoke of your house as though it was their house. You were like, excuse me? <laughs> you know, and so, but, but I get it. Just give us some thought here. Okay, any uh, last question, comment, statement before I just moved on. Okay, the next week you should come to church with a sense of expectation. On so the next week, okay, so we done had this great experience this Sunday. Yes, said we had a powerful experience. Oh, my God. People are being blessed. God was speaking. The word was just awesome. There are people being saved. I mean, when was the last time you went to church and somebody truly gave their life to Christ? And so the next week you come to church with a sense of expectation because you're thinking about what happened last week only to be disappointed when a service simply follows the program. And the program, our typical format of service, this is spiritually unhealthy. Hmm. And yes. this happens at times. We program God so much. And hmm. I now understand that when we begin, the church begin to grow, we have three services, four services sometime. And because we don't got become mega and before you, time you start feeling the presence of God, it's time to take up the offering and dismiss. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, okay, but if the church doesn't know how to achieve the most holy place worship each and every Sabbath, it it will project an image of inconsistent, idiocratic, uh, uh, idiocratic God who is incompletely elusive. And, uh, and anybody else look at that word other than me? I looked that word up and I tell you, and I'm being honest with you, I couldn't make sense of it, but I know some of you. Uh, has a high IQ to mine. So look that word up. I looked it up last week and I, I had some thoughts about it, but I knew we were going to get to it. And that's one of the reasons why I highlighted this. What's that word? What, what is it again? <laughs> I got idiosyncratic. 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 Yeah. I guess um, that's Yeah, look, let's look that word up. See what we come up with. Put all our brains together. I bet you that it has something to do with being an idiot. <laughs> it has to do with your, I, I thought about that. I thought of <laughs> okay, I have it. Well, something inconsistent. Okay, idiosyncratic means having strange or unusual habits, ways of behaving, or features. Okay, that's really good. I didn't mind did not give me that, but I like that. So inconsistency. Our behavior patterns are inconsistent. And so therefore, when people go to church, they don't know what they're going to get. Are we going to have a great time today? Or is somebody going to leave mad? Somebody going to get up and just slam their Bible? You know, you don't know what you're going to get. So this is what hurt the church because you're inviting people to church, but you're, you're kind of uh, have your fingers crossed, toes crossed, and just let, let us have a good day. Don't let the pastor get up and lay everybody out today. Because you got some pastors that are not preachers. They're just, all they do is master arguing, arguing and fussing and raising an offering. That's what people, mo that's what some get that mm -hmm. blows my mind. How do you stay at a place where you're not getting no kind of love? Even when you rebuke, there, there still needs to be some type of love. I pastor 25 years. I rebuked. I reproved and I corrected, but the people have never left the church, of, uh, the house of God without the word of God still pouring some love on them, letting them know that God chasing those who he loved. I let them know it come because the, God loves you. And I don't want them to leave not feeling loved by God's heaven because if they can't get love from God's house, me and them sure are not going to get it when they get home. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some consistency of love. No matter how God moves, the love of God still ought to be in the church, whether it's reproof, correction, whether it's teaching, it still ought to be the people ought to be able to go to God's house and still feel the love of God. Sure. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. let's move on. I think that um so we're talking about the most holy place. I don't think I highlighted anything beyond this. Let me see. And so next, okay, I'm looking, I didn't highlight anything beyond this. Okay, let me go. Let me go back to, I'm gonna come out of the book. Okay, and I, I am going to, what's in front of your screen? The book. The book is still there? Yeah. So Lamilly, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. So let, let me let no, me it's us. Real, We're back. real quick. 
I need to switch out a little bit. Okay, let me, excuse me, let me, uh, oh boy, hold on a minute. Um, okay, we're, okay, so I need to click on the slideshow. Or we should be out in just a few minutes here. Let me, come on here, her rainbow. Huh, that will not work right. What's going on here? Hmm. Uh, okay, excuse me. I'm getting ready to hit myself here. Uh, come on, slideshow. Why aren't you working? Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay, so my slideshow is not working, so I apologize. So we've been through multi-dimensional water, the outer court, um, number six, the inner court, number seven. Um, again, um, let me see here. Hold on a minute. Okay, multi-dimensional worship inner court. And so uh, next week, uh, we run to get into chapter three. So I did finish my slides and we did go into the book. Um, I'm going to cut this off here. Now, next week, if you open up your books quickly, I want to look at chapter three. That's on page 61. Multi-dimensional music. Okay. okay, so next week we're reading chapter three and we're reading chapter four, the threshing floor. Uh, the threshing floor. Now, when we talk about the threshing floor, what prophet or prophetess made that uh, information or knowledge of the threshing floor popular? I need a bottom. Well, I need a bottom. And I want you to study that and think about her teaching about it and how she presented it. And let us, uh, I, not I'm trying to examine her, but but she did make it popular. She talked about it a lot. It was a, a strong part of her ministry. So you have to read through chapter four. Now, but when it comes down to multidimensional music, we want you to, everyone is reading this and I want you to give me uh do you agree with the author and how he brings this out? And I'm going to say this. I personally don't agree with everything because one of the things that he does talk about in chapter two and in going into chapter three, he feels though that every worship church should have a pretty much of a, um, a worship like the uh, Hebraic type worship style. So therefore, however, the Hebrews worship are should totally mimic. Now, I love the three dimensions of the inner outer court and all of that. But I, I believe that there is some independency in worship that everybody don't have the same a worship, have to have the same worship style. And I think he's confused mm -hmm. his style uh, with some other things. And it blows my mind that he is he's Jewish. You get that. You all see that through the book that he is. He's, he's uh, raised as a uh, Jewish uh, religious leader, but he's teaching in a denominational church. So he's got a battle going on with his, uh, he was raised Jewish, but he's in a Christian church. Mm. And so I don't know how he's doing his church because according to this book, and we're going to get into it next week, he has a problem with the Christian worship. And I think and he it seemed like he wants to, uh, to change our style of worship, which I don't have a problem with style. I, have, I, I think what we talked about, we have a problem with order. What comes first? Repentance comes first. I love that he brings in order. Okay, but when it comes down to style, I, I, I have no problem with our, the, the songs that we sang, majority of them. And next week, what I think, the uh, only thing I really um, was trying to get... Uh, to bring it tonight that I'm not going to have time to want to talk about crossover music. So if there is an assignment, and there is an assignment, I forgot about this, I need just a couple of paragraphs of crossover music and name one crossover song. I got a crossover song that's going to blow your mind next week. You're going to like, <laughs> yeah, but yes, this is sung in the church, and the song don't mention nothing about God at all. <laughs> It don't mm. even it don't even it don't have a G anywhere in any of the lyrics. But people sing it in the church all the time and then have sung it, but it don't mention God. And they play it on the radio station. I've listened to it like he just said what I thought he said. 
<laughs> you know, this mm. man was asking, God, did you send me a woman? He didn't say God sent me a wife. He said, God sent me a woman. I'm like, really? <laughs> so, but mm. this, so again, so I want you to bring, listen to gospel music all this week and find me one crossover song and, 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 and send it to me because what I want to do, uh, what you may feel is a crossover song may not be a crossover. What is a crossover song? Yes, because they play it in the street does not necessarily mean that someone crossed the line with God. So that's something else to think about. Just because they're playing the street, mm -hmm. does that mean that God is upset because they're playing it out there? You know, uh, what's the have you? And then crossover two is that you got some worldly singers that's crossing into gospel. Uh, uh, the, the church is playing. Uh, there are certain people that's not trying to sing gospel but the gospel station especially kirk franklin i listen to him all the time he plays certain singers that's not they're not claiming salvation but i guess he likes their song and he plays it on a gospel station so a crossover works both ways the church trying to get into the world and the world trying to get into the church so what say ye about that send me what you got so i can pull it up and have these songs ready for us next week and let us examine them now let me say this somebody have a problem with us examining the bible says that we all may prophesy but let the others judge remember last week that we did bring up the one important information that wasn't mentioned today that music also prophesies we brought it up last week so if music prophesies at, at the bible says in first corinthians i believe it's around about the 14th chapter that we may judge prophecy then we should be able to judge music too so, so the, especially if you are a pastor you need to you should not want anything and everything sung and played in your church if you are a leader. So this is your homework assignment. I'm looking forward to, for you to send me the crossover assignment, uh, 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 crossover music, and you have uh, chapter three and four to read, and we're really focusing on that thrust floor. Okay? So, so um, Dr. Short, on yes. the thrust floor, we're just going to read about it. We're not going to write you anything about it. Just no, you're not gonna, you don't have to ready. write it, but we're going to discuss this openly next week. Okay. The only thing, I, the only thing you have to write to me is about your, with your thoughts on crossover, and you're going to send me um, one of what you think is a crossover song. But when you say crossover, is that song crossing over from the world to the church, or is it crossing over? Was it written by a Christian, and that Christian song left went from the church into the world? Where did it cross over? Because this week I heard broke. I heard both. Mm. And we want to discuss it. Why are there crossover songs? Why can't you just stay in your lane? But that's an interesting reason why the crossover is getting popular. In your lane. Oh <laughs> well, uh, let me say this. Back in the day, worldly people didn't want to see Christians at the club. They would say to you, what you doing here? Man, you know you don't belong here. They would tell you that you know you don't belong here. But now, I think they're used to it. They're, uh, they're not shocked to seeing uh, pastors with liquor bottles and drinking. I, I don't want to get into it right now, but I don't think that's a big deal like it was years ago. So, okay, so God bless you, saints of God. Uh, give me an hour, and this recording will be on YouTube. You can go and rewatch it again if you need to, okay? God bless you. May have a smile upon you, and uh, we'll see you all next week.